In this video, I'm talking about the song Jennifer's Veil by The Birthday Party. Now, The Birthday Party were a post-punk band. I suppose you'd describe them as a post-punk band from the early 80s. Nick Cave on vocals, Roland S. Howard on guitar, one of my personal guitar heroes. I'm going to begin by playing a bit of the song for you, and then I'll talk about what's going on. birthday party formed in the late 70s in Melbourne, Australia, and according to Wikipedia, they are one of the darkest and most challenging post-punk bands to emerge in the 80s. And this one is amongst my favourite birthday party tracks. I mean, I do like the noisy and chaotic stuff too, but this one has just got tons of atmosphere, some lovely guitar work from Roland S. Howard. So let me break it down for you. And then towards the end of the video, I will also talk about the gear that I'm using in this video and talk a little bit about how to get the Roland S. Howard sound. A quick word on the key and the tuning for this one. I'm playing this in the key of E minor. If you listen to the recording, it's actually closer to F minor. And what I suspect happened was they sped the tape up in the studio um, for whatever reason. And there is, in fact, a, an amazing documentary you can see on YouTube. I'll put a link to that on screen. You can actually see them recording this track, I think, at Hansa Studios in Berlin. And they're definitely playing it in the key of E minor for most of the takes there. And then on the master take, it, it seems to have been sped up for whatever reason. So uh, no big deal. You just need to be aware of that if you want to play along to the original recording. Probably best then if you just put a capo on at the first fret. Let's take a look at the opening riff, which is very, very simple. It just goes like this. <laughs> that kind of idea. So uh, we're starting with the low E string and then we're jumping up an octave and then we've got this B flat note first fret on the A string and I'm hammering down onto the B at the second fret. So we're emphasizing that flat five, that tritone sound which is part of what gives this tune it's kind of menacing and, and dark atmosphere I think so we've got and this song is in three or perhaps in a six eight kind of time signature so it depends how you want to count it but it's kind of one two three one two three or one two three four five six one two three four five six so the rhythm of that riff we've got one two three four five six one two three four five six and in fact you can hear 
quite a few variations on that basic riff. I think that's probably the best way to learn it to start with. But then you can try some little embellishments or variations. So this one crops up quite a lot. So just a little hammer on and pull off from the B flat to the B. Or Sometimes I think it goes down to the open A string. So lots of little variations you can try there. You don't need to worry too much about that. You can just vary it as you see fit throughout the song. Now the verse pattern is based on that main riff and when the vocals first come in, it sets, I think, a kind of six bar phrase up. And it's actually quite a funny uh, moment in the documentary where Roland is trying to teach Nick Cave the song and he's getting confused about the number of repeats and the, the length of the phrases and I, I do sympathise with Nick Cave here it is a little bit confusing you know how many repeats there are on each of these riffs but it seems to be this sort of six bar phrase as I say which goes like this so <laughs> That's our six bar phrase. It starts off with our basic riff or one of those variations that I just discussed played three times. So and then we're going up to up to G, a kind of G chord. So Roland just just playing single notes here. So we're playing a G then over onto the next string C and B jumping up to this G flat or F sharp and then third fret on the low E string giving that a little bit of a bend and then the open low E string again so, so I love the wide intervals here that kind of angular quality of this riff it's really nice we play that, then we play the, the, the main riff another couple of times. So. so that's our six bar phrase. I think that's played three or maybe four times to, to, to make up the entire verse. So let me just play those six bars one more time. Simple enough to play, but try and make it sound as good as you possibly can. So you can you know, really make those notes pop out, give it a bit of twang by picking a bit closer to the bridge. You can add a bit of dynamic in there as well. So maybe on this riff, you can play a bit more softly. And then when it goes to G, you can just dig in a little bit harder. So just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy to get it sounding really good so just spend some time playing around with that. Then we're on to the chorus and Roland is switching from single notes to strummed chords and it's a really lovely chord progression this and the the basic chord progression is this so we've got E minor and we're just ascending G, A minor, B minor it goes around again but there's a slight twist on those chords so we've got E minor and then we've got C or C7 and then B. So those are the basic chords but what makes it really nice are the, the little embellishments on those chords that Roland is throwing in. So I think it starts off with just a straight E minor chord. Then we're going to a G chord. You can play this just as a straight G major chord. Sometimes with these chords it's quite hard to hear the third and therefore to hear whether these chords are actually major or minor. I don't know if that's something to do with Roland's technique. Maybe he's not sort of barring all the way across. If, if you kind of curve your first finger round, then you can sometimes just release pressure on the third string and then you get... It's kind of, kind of hard to do, but you get that kind of sound where you're not hearing whether the chord is major or minor. I mean, you don't need to worry about this 
stuff too much out of G major chord is going to work here. And then on the next chord, A minor, I'm hearing this. The addition of this F sharp note here, so you can play that with your little finger on the, the second string at the seventh fret, and you can hammer down that note. So a nice little embellishment that. And then we're going to B minor. And just putting down the second finger at the eighth fret on the second string there. Just as a little variation on that chord. And then we're back to E minor. C7, I'm playing that as a bar chord at the, the eighth fret. So in terms of fret numbers here, we've got eight, 10, eight, nine, 11th fret there with the pinky, and then eight on top. Then I'm coming down to B. I'm hearing this as a B major chord here. That's what I'm playing, but you know, that third is, is not always in there, I don't think. So it's kind of almost more of a, a power chord there. Um, and then we've got this at the end of the phrase, so just again dropping that second finger down to the second string and then using the little finger at the 10th fret on the top string and you get this this kind of fifth interval on top, a G, G and a D. Just emphasising that and that's what turns the phrase around. As far as the strumming goes again it's that 6-8 kind of feel so that there are some variations in the strumming. If you want a fixed strumming pattern for this uh, I would suggest something like this. So so down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, down, down. Just you know, emphasising those last three strums at the end of the phrase. Then right at the end of the chorus we're going back to single notes. It's really outlining those same chords but with single notes. So we've got this. So it's a more lovely twangy stuff here. So starting with the E and the, the octave E. We're going up to G. We've still got that E on top, and then we've got a bit more of this tritone stuff. So F sharp, C, B, and a high F sharp, bending that third fret on the, the low E string again. We go around again, and the second time, kind of you know, hinting at that C7 sound, we've got a C. Then uh, up to the third fret on the third string, kind of B flat. Then B. Got a high G note here. I'm playing it fifth fret on the D string. You could play that as an open string if you wanted to. And then to to finish off, I'm just bending at the second fret on the low E string. And then we've got to the open low E string back into the main riff. I just play that twangy bit one more time. So that's largely it for the main guitar part. It just goes around again for another couple of verses and choruses. There is a second guitar part which is also really nice on the recording. This is in the right hand speaker and this has got some atmospheric harmonics in there and also some strumming in the chorus where he's playing some alternate chord voicing. So I'm not playing the harmonics part exactly like on the 
recording it's kind of you know, tough to learn all of that note for note I don't think you'd really want to do something like that the best thing to do is just to uh, experiment with the kind of ideas that Roland is using and, and do your own thing it's really with this kind of part it's all about listening to and responding to the vocals so you hear the vocal phrases you can you know, emphasize some of the vocal phrases or try and find some gaps in between the phrases in which to play these harmonics but what he's doing is playing harmonics at the 12th fret and also up here at the uh, what is that the 19th fret um, or also down down at the 7th fret you get the same the same harmonics there so you know, at the 12th fret you've got notes which are an octave higher than the the open strings and uh, since guitar is essentially tuned in an E minor kind of tuning then all of these notes are going to sound good against this track um, and also with the notes at the seventh fret this is another octave higher than the 12th fret harmonics but still the same notes as the open strings so all of those notes are going to work and in fact the notes at the 19th fret and at the 17th fret are identical so it doesn't really matter whether you play at the the seventh fret or the 19th fret so that's really what I was doing sometimes I was striking multiple strings And sometimes I was just picking out individual notes. And you can also hear that Roland's using a, a little bit of the uh, the vibrato arm there for some of this stuff. So that that sounds nice too. If you've got one of these. So experiment with that stuff. Just try and. You know, create some nice atmospheres and then for the chorus and I couldn't pick this up by listening to the recording but as I say in this documentary you can see Roland getting together some of these parts uh, what he seems to be doing for the second guitar part on the chorus is playing the same kind of chords but mostly in the open position so we've got E minor and playing a G kind of a G power chord and then A minor but he's got this F sharp note on top, which gives you that minor sixth sound, which is really nice. And going to a B minor, I'm going back to the E minor. And this time I'm playing the C7 down here instead of up here. So, and then playing some kind of B chord. It's hard to say whether it's major or minor. Maybe he's just muting the third but uh, you can you know, play, it, play it however you want really major or minor will, will work there and then you can jump up to this these are the same notes played in in the main rhythm guitar part so the G and the D So that's the second guitar part and uh, yeah it's kind of nerdy to be sort of geeking out over all these little details but it is I think quite interesting how Roland S. Howard arranges this track. So there's some really nice ideas there for, for second guitar parts. So if one of the guitars is playing a riff the other guitar can do something that contrasts with that something atmospheric and then for the chorus essentially you've got a double track but the two guitars are playing different voicings of the chords which is something that always works well when you're recording just to make everything sound a little bit thicker and a bit bigger. Let's briefly talk about gear and Roland's definitely got a very distinctive sound and the sound you hear on this song you can hear it in some of the other birthday party stuff but you can definitely hear it in some of the bands he was subsequently in and on his solo records as well and it's this very bright quite abrasive sound it's a little bit surf it's a little bit rockabilly lots of reverb sometimes you've got tremolo in there as well and Roland was famous for using a white Fender Jaguar uh, I think mostly through Fender amps and I've never owned a Fender Jaguar I'm actually quite tempted to get one I love the kind of sounds that Roland gets and uh, you know, for one reason or another I went down the Jazzmaster route and uh, you know, it's worth saying that though Jaguars and Jazzmasters are superficially quite similar they're very different beasts with very different characteristics I think so uh, today I'm using my Jazzmaster this is a, a reissue 60s Jazzmaster I think it does the job in this kind of track it's not exactly like Roland's sound but I think it's fairly close so yeah using this guitar bridge pickup 
and using my Fender Deluxe amp, I think Roland often used a Fender Twin, which is a very bright, very loud, very clean amp, and the Fender Deluxe is the closest I can get to that. And I think it sounds pretty good. I'm actually going into the to the bright channel on this amp. Not something I normally do. It usually gets a bit too harsh, but um, I think with Roland S. Howard, you do want that brightness, that kind of slightly glassy, abrasive sound. And I'm not using any effect at all. I'm just plugging straight into the amp. Reverb is coming from the amp. Loads of spring reverb on this one. I've actually got it on uh, about eight or nine. So it seems like quite an extreme setting, but uh, I tried it uh, with the reverb on about four or five, but it just didn't translate onto the recording. You can't hear it in the room, but uh, needed more for the recording. So that's a, a good lesson, I think. Trust your ears when it comes to amp settings, not, not your eyes. I mean, if some extreme settings kind of look a bit weird on amps, but if it's sounding good, I would go with it. Anyway, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> That's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like Tab, it's going to be up on my Patreon page. You probably know how that works by now. Go to my Patreon page and pay what you like. Get access to my lovingly put together tabs. And I've also done a little backing track for this one as well. So check those out if you're interested. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.